with that, I would like to invite panel one to take the stage on the importance of geoscientific research mapping and developing low temperature areas in Germany, moderated by Sara Borufka. Please, floor is yours. Thank you. So, hello again to some of you. I've met a lot of the female members of this audience in the women's session this morning, and I was also told that Nordic countries have a custom of using the first name only. So um, I will abide gladly by this custom and address all of my panelists by first name. And also I would like to thank Maria and Petur for this warm welcome. And we as guests of the embassy would also like to thank the staff of the embassy of Iceland, which has made this possible, thanks to Ruth, Nicole, and all the others, Green by Iceland and Energiewächter for preparing, organizing, and promoting what I'm confident will be an interesting summit on one of the most important topics of the present day. So, um, yeah, let's not waste any time and jump right into business. Our um, panelists today are Dr. Inga Möck, who is a leading expert, has more than 20 years of experience in geothermal research internationally and nationally. She is also the chair, vice president of um, the German Geothermal Association, which I am a member of. So. Um, we actually know each other, and she heads Geotis, which is the um, uh, sorry geothermal information system. Um, we have Stefan from Geothermy Neubrandenburg, GTN in short. He has been working in geothermal in this function for nine years as the head of reservoir engineering and simulation. Uh, next up, we have Professor Ingo Zas, or Ingo for short, who <laughs> joins us from Potsdam, where he is the head of the geoenergy section at the German Research, Research Center for Geosciences. And he has also held a visiting professorship in Iceland at the School for Renewable Energy Science at the University of Akurairi. Um, from Iceland, joining us, we have Kristen Ingerson, who is the manager of uh, Geothermal Plant Division with Manvit, and he has managed projects in countries such as Hungary, the US, Slovakia, Ethiopia, and the Philippines, to name just a few, actually. And he is involved in a, a training program under the auspices of UNESCO, the Geothermal Training Program. And last but not least, let me introduce also from Iceland, Ani, who is the CEO of ISOR, the Iceland Geo Survey, and prior to that worked as a, at a, as a managing director at Manvit in Budapest, Hungary. He has decades of experience working both nationally and internationally in the public and private sector, actually too much experience to name here. So I won't do that. Um, let's focus on our panel. But before we jump into the discussion, um, Ingo would like to hold a short speech in memory of one of the pioneers of bilateral German and Icelandic research, um, Axel Björnsson, who has sadly recently passed. So, yeah. Dear Minister, dear Excellencies, dear ladies and gentlemen, uh, it's a duty to me and just shortly take your time um, to um, uh, remind <coughs> us of the um, death uh, of Axel Björnsson, Professor Axel Björnsson, was in, in a triple function important for that, what we have here today. He was a pioneer of geothermal energy in Iceland. He was a pioneer in cooperating between Iceland and Germany, and he did both. He worked on shallow, uh, on, on low temperature geothermal system as well as on um, uh, high temperature system. So just some short notes about his um, Vita. Um, he passed away with, in the age of uh, 80, very silently, um, two weeks ago. And uh, however, he was born in uh, Reykjavik in uh, 1942. And after some ways through school and so on, he did his um, PhD at the University of Göttingen and uh, finished his PhD in 1972. Then he went back to Iceland and uh, he had some very important roles. For example, from 1972 to 1990, um, he was um, heading in the um, Icelandic Energy Authority research 
um, the um, geophysics and the geothermal department, which did not really exist at this time. And in this period, for example, the um, utilization of sh uh, low temperature geothermal energy in uh, Iceland uh, extended from about 40% to 85% uh, with respect to the housings. And he was one of the, I would say, inventor of the Krapla geothermal field. He was strongly observing the major eruptions starting from 75 and afterwards the geothermal exploration started. I guess this is an important person and by the end he did some very important thing also which um, affects me strongly. He was starting a very, very successful short-running program of RES, Renewable Energy Science. It was a kind of a graduated uh, renewable energy education system from the University of Iceland and uh, from the University of Akurairi, and he was in charge for the geothermal program. So thank you for your audience and uh, for um, thinking a short second uh, on uh, Axel Bjornsson. Thanks, Ingo, for that. And so maybe in the spirit of uh, this pioneer, let's also um, come up with a discussion that maybe produces some more pioneering thoughts. But I like to keep it simple at the beginning. So the topic of our panel is the importance of geoscientific research, mapping, and developing low temperature areas in Germany. Now, Ingo, I know this sounds like a very basic question, but why is mapping of geothermal resources so important? Yeah, we still, we are dealing with the geological underground and the geological underground is var variable. So it is a typical and a standard engineering task to explore the underground we have to work with. And uh, due to the variability of the underground, we have to adopt methods, temperatures and ranges. Therefore, we are also talking about a technology family of geothermal. We cannot say it is uh, just substituting, for example, solar thermal energy. We have different systems, different temperature systems. We have different drilling tasks and so on. So it is a... Um, uh, uh, a technology where we need highly educated engineers and scientists, and this will continue. Great. And Arni, could you maybe speak to the importance of mapping in Iceland and also how maybe you were able to transfer this expertise from Iceland to other regions in the world? Thank you. Well, not being a geologist, I, I will do my best. But <laughs> when I started in this, in, in this industry, almost two decades ago now, the first thing I learned that was that no two geothermal projects are the same. So you, you always, are, like Ingo said, you're always dealing with the geology, however that is. So you need the, the, the sciences, you need the mapping, uh, you need to look into what is there, what is the geology, so you need the ge geophysicists, etc., etc. So So no two systems are the same. You have to look into it, you have to do the mapping, you have to do the do the research and, and exploring and all that. But uh, what we have managed to do back in Iceland is actually to, to transfer our knowledge from this volcanic island into other parts of, of, of the world, although they are not, do not have the same geology. So, so Icelandic uh, scientists have been working here in, in Europe, in Central Europe, in Africa, Asia, wherever it is, using similar methods. And uh, I already mentioned, Inga, that you run the Geotis system. So maybe from the field, could you speak to its methods, how you acquire data, et cetera? Well, acquiring data, this is part of research. And we also um, <coughs> make access to those data. And I think this is not a problem to map, to evaluate existing data, making them available. Um, for me, the key question is how to communicate expert data to the field of geothermal, because geothermal is very interdisciplinary. We have geoscientists, we have engineers, we have economists, and all of them, they have to understand those expert data. And um, we, we make access to those uh, geoscientific data in our geothermal information system, which is pretty unique, I think, uh, I think even in, in the world. But 
to guide uh, non-experts, and non-experts are the energy providers in geothermal, they step in now in geothermal, how to make access to reliable data, how to guide them to reliable data so that their project will be successful. This is for me the, the big question, how to communicate knowledge. Stefan, you actually work in the field and um, from an engineer's point of view, how would you rate the access to open and private mapping data? Um, and what is maybe the business perspective of this as well? Yeah, the access is very important for us, for all of us, because on one hand, as Inga introduced, it's important to understand the systems because it's not always the same. And the free access especially is important because uh, it's for our company and also for other partners in the industry, important to get easy access to this data, not only the maps, but also geophysical data, petrophysical data, all the information that we need to identify potential spots to develop uh, geothermal projects. So it's for everyone important to achieve fast development for geothermal in Germany and everywhere in the world, of course. Okay, great. So we actually very briskly focused on the first aspect, which leads us to the second aspect of the panel, which is geoscientific research. So maybe Ingo can speak to one of the most important topics, I think, in a lot of fields, but especially in geothermal, which is uh, the skilled labor shortage in that area and how it m could maybe negatively affect the future or even already has and how we can maybe turn this around so that Iceland and Germany could work together in addressing skilled labor shortage. Well, uh, fundamentally in uh, geothermal, um, was that my explanation? Oh. <laughs> Excuse me, fundamentally, if we consider um, geothermal reservoir exploration, we have always um, uh, a need to combine different methods and uh, 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 disciplines. Um, that means uh, we have to reflect this into education and um, the application of such things is for us as a, being in a research center very important to bring our research into practical applications. But um, the ge geothermal in industry in Germany is comparatively small. We have not even 30,000 uh, people in jobs. Uh, and uh, if we consider the plans of the federal government and also uh, the necessities of climate change, we have to enhance this number to a, a range of about 700,000. And therefore, I see here in this um, community, um, um, for example, also joining the experiences in Iceland and probably more more low, lower temperature fields in Germany that could be a good starter to uh, deepen and enhance our cooperation. And I think, uh, Kristen, you also work in the education. Uh, maybe you could talk a little bit about the program that you're involved with um, under the auspices of UNESCO. Yes, <coughs> I can. Yeah, I'm involved in this geothermal training program in Iceland, which is though uh, mainly um, designed for developing countries. So we actually have been helping people from developing countries for, and, and do this uh, training program. Uh, and actually that has been ongoing since 79, I believe. So it actually has a long history and a uh, lot of things have been doing there, have been done there. Uh, regarding the, the geothermal community is, is, is quite, uh, quite small. You could see that when you come to Conferences, they're, they're more or less all the same faces you recognize from one, one year to another. But I, though, had this, it was a little bit different in a conference I attended last autumn, following the COVID stop. But it turned out that there were, were uh, new faces there. And there were younger people and were more women. women. So actually it was a kind of a being developed in the right direction, I believe. Also, I just want to mention also you, in the earlier question regarding the uh, importance of mapping. Uh, the, uh, I'm one of the people who, who take, who, who get the information from geologists and, and trying to do something with it. And presently, the only way to uh, get the thermal from the ground is a drill. There might be in the future some, some magical stuff being developed, but this is a reality now. And the drilling cost is actually quite high. And uh, mostly that is makes uh, the biggest hurdle in developing uh, new 
uh, concessions. So, and the importance of having a good, uh, good uh, mapping, good uh, survey on which to base the well design, the targeting, etc., is, is very important. And as I say, the, the drilling cost is quite high, but if you drill a successful well, that is usually not considered a problem, the cost. So the importance to, to drill a successful well is, is, is quite big, and that is more or less based on good uh, service, good geological service. So um, this is not exactly a research point, but it just fits so well here. Arne, we talked uh, in the beginning about um, the incentives in Iceland to uh, kind of m mitigate this risk of not finding something. Could you speak uh, to some of the early loan programs? Uh, absolutely. Uh, maybe if, I, if I'm allowed just to, to, to touch briefly upon the uh, educational point, because I used to work a lot with GTN in my previous job, and, and Dr. Peter Seib, who is the managing director there, he sometimes said, well, if you combine the, the geothermal expertise with the, the, the German engineering expertise, you have something. And, and I truly believe this is the case. So I think there is a field of, of, of a possible, uh, what should we say, increased cooperation between the two nations. That is, that is within education. And this is actually something that we worry a bit about in Iceland because uh, historically when we have volcanic eruptions you see that young people they kind of flock into the universities to learn uh, geology that is not the case now that is not the case now so so this is something to be worried about how do we actually renew the the uh, the specialization the expertise within the universities so i just wanted to to touch upon that uh, cooperation between Germany and Iceland within the, the field of education is, is truly an opportunity, I believe. Back to, back to funding. <coughs> uh, the, um, the fact is that the, the, the geothermal development in Iceland started uh, with a political decision. It was a pol political decision to go for geothermal. There was a debate at the municipality uh, uh, level uh, whether to go with geothermal or gas heating. And luckily, the people that actually were talking about the geothermal, they, they, they won the elections. So this was the first. It was a political decision. Secondly, again, a political decision made for the funding. So, so we made a governmental fund that actually funded the exploration, the drilling, the risky part of geothermal. Uh, the municipality could, could apply. They got funding or not, let's, let's say they got funding, uh, the, uh, the project was successful, they paid it back with low interest in a long time. If it, was, if it was unsuccessful, the loan was written off. So we as a nation took the risk, uh, and this actually developed in a way where more than 90% of all households in Iceland today are heated by geothermal. A political decision both for, for going there, but also for the funding. And this is critical. And I've been in this for a while. And, and the threshold always is the funding for the riskier part of the geothermal project. That is the exploration and the drilling. So, and, and I, I, this is happening now elsewhere in the world. You see, like in Africa, we have the geothermal risk mitigation facility, GRMF. This is moving things. This is happening in Turkey. This is happening in Latin America now. This is not happening in Europe. Hmm. Why? Yeah, where where more than 50% point. of the energy needs are for heating and cooling. Yeah. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so there is a very beautiful and simple solution for that. We just need to put it into practice. And I think, uh, Inga, you are a big friend and proponent of putting things into practice. Maybe um, you can talk a bit about the role of research and maybe also inspire young people to... Um, go for geothermal in their decision what to become in this world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. as you heard, it's all about lower, lowering the risk. And what is the problem with geothermal projects is this, um, yeah, this uh, capex opex uh, ratio. Yeah, We have this high investment cost and high risk at the beginning. And applied research, of course, can help in this situation to reduce the risk, but what do we need? Applied research means 
pilot projects, operational projects. We only learn from practice, from operation, from exploration, from drilling, from uh, reservoir operation. And um, what we actually need is, or what I developed is this geothermal plate type catalog. And geothermal plate type means we have uh, geological analogs worldwide and when we learn how to explore and exploit a certain geothermal plate type, we can adapt this to other places in the world. And here Iceland and Germany can work together to learn from each other, to develop this geothermal plate types and the plate type specific exploration and exploitation. I think this is what research can help assist to reduce this uh, bad uh, ratio between uh, CAPEX and OPEX. Wonderful. And uh, maybe elaborating on that point, what would it take for people to go to universities and specifically sign up for programs that um, end up putting you in the field of geothermal? Um, well, we have the problem that we don't have enough students and I would say uh, it would help that students would come to university and would study the right, uh, the right topic. <laughs> uh, so what makes we, geothermal we, the right topic? Um, well, we need, as I said, it's a very interdisciplinary field. We need geoscientists, engineers, uh, economists. Um, so wh whatever you are from the background, whatever you are interested, you can step into geothermal research. What we also offer as uh, professors is very interdisciplinary lectures where we combine geosciences and economics. Yeah? So this is what we already combined to help people to think interdisciplinary, uh, but they have to do it and uh, now it's a little bit provocative maybe but I think it's it helps our energy transition more to go to university and to study instead of sticking to the roads. Okay great. <laughs> well, yeah. my opinion. Um, so uh, the panel also has in its title the term low temperature and it's actually quite funny because uh, low temperature can mean very different things in different countries as I've learned preparing for this panel. So Andy, maybe you can tell us what in Iceland is considered low temperature. Yeah, like I said before, I mean, we are, we are a volcanic island so, so the, uh, the temperature is a little bit different back there than what you are used to maybe in most cases. But we, we tend to talk about low temperature uh, for everything that is below 120 degrees. Uh, so that's <laughs> low temperature in Iceland. Okay. Uh, so. And this is what you what you commonly use for direct heating, for bathing, etc. etc. Well you don't bathe in 120 but maybe a little bit less than that. <laughs> Hopefully. Inter intermediate uh, is what we tend to call 120 to 200. So, so that is for, for power production with, with binary technology, etc. Everything above 200 uh, is high temperature in the, in the Icelandic term, kind of. So, uh, but but uh, what, is, what is happening today, uh, luckily, is that the lower the temperature, uh, the more, what should we say, opportunities to utilize. And this is different from, from what it used to be. I mean, the, the heat pump technology, et cetera, et cetera, gives us the opportunity to use the, the hot water, even though it's a lot below 120. Mm. So those are conditions, of course, that we can only dream of here. But still, why is it important to look at our low temperature areas, Inga? Well, the one point is, uh, it's brilliant yes, that you mentioned the temperature, what is high and low, because this is not scientifically <laughs> defined, high and low, and therefore we talk of uh, geothermal plate types, because this is a geological uh, environment and this is much better to compare. And of course we have also in Germany geological environments with those high temperatures in the Upper Rheingraben, for example. For us it would be very interesting co to collaborate concerning um, uh, logging, drilling, technologies and high temperature environments, which is for you and for us high temperature. So, but this is dedicated to a geological environment and this is what we can bring forward. Thinking in geothermal play types and uh, finding the right operation uh, systems uh, to work in those environments. And uh, we have some people who work on the field on the panel, so why not address them? So um, what are your needs and challenges when it comes to the low temperature areas, Stefan? 
Oh, for the challenge, the most uh, challenges is to communicate this problem because when people when we talk to people and talking about uh, geothermal, they think uh, on Iceland, they think about power production. Then we are not that lucky in Germany. Then we have some areas, as Inga mentioned, in the Rheingraben in Bavaria, where we have high temperatures that are suitable for direct heat uh, usage. And but in northern Germany, we are not that lucky. There are just a few areas where we have high temperatures above 80 degrees Celsius. So mostly we are here in the range from 50 to 60 degrees. Um, and when we talk to people, you can have 50 to 60 degrees Celsius. They say, "Okay, I can't do anything with this." But um, there is a technology, technology evolved uh, in the last 10, 15 years, and it's now economically feasible, so we can use uh, heat pumps. So large-scale heat pumps can bring the temperatures from these low levels up to high levels on an economical way. So we can uh, produce and develop uh, successful geothermal projects in uh, Germany or northern Germany as well. So you were involved in uh, planning one of those projects which has really had a cutting-edge technology and has been also the center of uh, massive attention from the media. Can you speak a little bit about what makes uh, the uh, Schwerin project so unique? Yeah, thinking about uh, geothermal in northern Germany, there was a large history, like back in the uh, late 80s, early 90s, there have been uh, developments in, for geothermal in northern Germany, and they are still operating, but for several years there was almost nothing happening, or just a lot of research has been done, a lot of um, planning has been done, and a lot of investigations. But nowadays, due to this project, where we showed that drilling doesn't need to be so deep, just uh, 1.3 kilometers, which is much cheaper than in other areas in the world or in the deeper geothermal reservoirs, that makes uh, a large benefit. And there we have shown that it's possible to achieve a high productive reservoir with moderate temperatures and bring this into a district heating grid. So in Shireen, I think it's about seven megawatts thermal energy and keeping in mind that geothermal is always scalable by just increasing flow rate, adding more wells, we can of course increase uh, the, the coverage of the heat demand. Kristen, you have also worked, I think, in some areas that are not exactly known for their geothermal resources yet mm -hmm. have come to implement this in a very uh, successful way. Could you speak to that? Yes, the <coughs> I think you refer to project in Hungary. Like, uh, actually, there the drilling successful the, uh, success there we, we reached water of 80 degrees and above, so it actually was not cold. Uh, now the challenge is of utilizing this cold uh, or rather low temperature fluid is the actually the output from the well is well naturally it's, it's less than for a hotter fl fluid. So it means that the drilling cost becomes more critical uh, in the, in the uh, yeah, it has plays a, it's a bigger role. But there are opportunities in utilizing the cold water and actually uh, coming again to this project in Hungary, even though they are not having not uh, water sufficient to, to for the uh, to for the district heating for to at when it's at full load meaning that when they need the hottest water, which is usually well above 100 degrees, it still, still can uh, generate quite a lot of energy when, in, in when the, the outside temperature is not the lowest. So it's, when it's a partial load on the, the, on the district heating system, usually you can use uh, uh, colder water. Great. So, so that is obviously an advantage. And one other thing perhaps first to, to be in mind is that the, the, the low, lower <coughs> temperature water, the uh, possible chemical problems related to that, they are less compared to the, for example, high, temp high enthalpy fluid we are dealing with in, in Iceland. This means that the, the wells can be utilized for, for decades. And we have wells in Iceland which have been operated, I believe, for more than 50 years. If I may, I think one of the challenges that we are dealing with is that historically people tend to, to, to connect geothermal with high temperature and with electricity production. And like Stefan touched upon, I mean, we, we, have, a, we have a huge opportunity in Europe for, for the lower temperatures, for district heating, for, for heating in general. Uh, no, some of it by a traditional technology like we used to do in Iceland, but some of it with heat pumps. 
I don't know how many of you know that uh, the Berlin Castle is heated by a geothermal system. Uh, the, the, the parliament here in Berlin is heated by a geothermal system, uh, both designed by DTN actually. But, but so, so we can use geothermal in so many places, not commonly known. In Paris, they have probably uh, 10 different geothermal district heating systems, <coughs> et cetera, et cetera. And we are sitting on the resource and we are not using it at the same time, as I said before, where 50% where of the energy needs are for heating. And guess what? You can use geothermal for cooling as well. So, so, so we, have a, we have a huge resource untapped. So I think that's also a point that, Inga, you are extremely passionate about this untapped resource and this thing we just talk about rather than putting it to use. Could you speak to that? Uh, instead of being passionate um, <laughs> because we, we have so much information already out there and um, as Stefan mentioned we we did a lot of research already mapped and and also make access to all this information where are actually um, the 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 pay zones, as we say, yeah. So the the good reservoirs, uh, uh, the depositions where you need to drill. What you actually need to do is, uh, as a community, as a municipality, just go to the geotis, uh, geothermal information system, and look just in a general way, oh, am I in a good uh, geothermal spot or in a not so good geothermal spot? So th there are so much information already out there. And what I experience is when I talk with people from municipalities, for example, they said, oh, this, uh, what, what is this, geotis? Or I don't know. So <laughs> I'm, I'm thinking, what else can we do to communicate this, those data, are the data too complicated to understand or do we have to guide them on an easier way? We thought about maybe making like a let's play guiding through geotis, yeah, to, mm. to make access to how to handle geotis. But this is, um, I'm, I'm asking myself, how, how to motivate people to go to reliable data? And this is another point. There's a, a lot of data, of course, out there. And there may be more data in future out there. But what is uh, good and reliable data and what are not so good data? And um, yeah, this uh, brings me back to the point that I mentioned in the beginning, that we have to communicate and, and guide also the non-experts through the whole knowledge we have and maybe we have to compile it in a better way i i i don't know for sh for now but uh, there's definitely a lot of knowledge already out there to to start uh, in a fast way the uh, heat transition here stefan what am i might uh, might may add is we always think about geothermal or like in, in most cases we think about in geothermal on the sub on the subsurface so we are interested in what is a uh, what is a pay zone where is the good areas how we can utilize it but we always have to think about to bring this to the energy engineers to bring it into the surface system to, to connect the source with the customer and this is important because we see it there's a big lack of people knowing how to bring this into the topic, so what is the energy or what is the energy demand, what is the heat demand, which can be covered by geothermal, which can be covered by other sources. That's a big point in geothermal where people, that people always forget a little bit, so mm -hmm. uh, I encourage people to think also in these areas to develop and uh, to train people. So I think because we actually managed to cover so many aspects already, I would like to give each of you the chance to maybe speak to what is important in terms of the future of geothermal here in Europe. And then I would like to open the floor from, for some questions from the audience, if that is okay. So maybe starting with Inga. <laughs> yeah. Um, in the past, we, we thought more in, oh, we want to reach a certain temperature range and we look to a certain depth. What we learn from our projects now is, yes, drilling, having a target is good, but having a second and a third target is even better uh, to have a backup uh, solution. And this brings us into a whole um, bunch of, of geothermal technologies, uh, direct use or uh, direct use plus heat pump or maybe indirect use. Um, so what, what we should do in future is when we explore the subsurface, not thinking only in one technology, not only in one reservoir uh, horizon, in one temperature level, but in the whole uh, on the whole geothermal gradient, let's say, in making 
make the best out of it what you get. Yeah, so that we don't have a failure of a project, but just it's maybe a different project, different than planned. Mm -hmm. And the Hamburg Wilhelmsburg project is such an example where they uh, aim to drill in a deeper section. Now they, they want to operate in a shallower section and it's a working project. Mm -hmm. So this is a brilliant example for that. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Inge, you said a lot that I wanted to say, but <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Might be there are some things, uh, of course, to, to bring the geothermal forward to, to make it faster to develop it. Of course, it's important to map, to ongoing mapping, it's, but it's also important to drill and to start exploration. And therefore, of course, funding is necessary or as a, as a big opportunity to reduce the risk for the clients or for the developers uh, for, to bring geothermal forward. Wonderful. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, as being a researcher, um, um, I have always a lot of things to research, but let's look for the priorities a little bit. So um, what we think is very important that uh, on the side of the computer science, the um, reservoir engineering, the geological engineering and the geological exploration, which is packed into numerical models, shall learn to talk to the energy system models. So we call this co-simulation. This is really, really an important point because I think that the energy consumer, or we think that the energy consumer, not necessarily does, uh, has to know what about the underground properties and so on. Because you normally never have this. If you're driving a car, you will not take care about how the gasoline is uh, refined or anything else. So I think we have to take uh, uh, this and bring it into the system. Then we have um, uh, Germany is very heterogeneous, more heterogeneous in geology than Iceland, also in, on the same scale. Um, and so we have a uh, multifold of reservoir systems and so on. And we have one underexplored system. This is uh, especially for heat storage and for probably later on hotter uh, applications. This is a crystalline basement. So we have the highest geothermal potential. Um, by far exceeding the other ones in the crystalline basement. So uh, a strong future activity and a fundamental research shall, shall be in the <coughs> crystalline basement. Mm -hmm. And at least um, we have to, and if you do statistics, um, there is of course a risk in geothermal drilling. In any drilling there is a risk. And if you do statistics, you will learn that the geothermal um, success in geothermal drillings globally is a little bit higher than in oil and gas drilling. So this is probably not known. That, that gives a glance on the, how media is acting with us, with the geothermal uh, industry and so on. So fundamentally, geothermal drilling is some percent su more successful than oil and gas drilling. And therefore, we have very clear uh, things we have to do. I think the, we have to put the basis for governmental funding and risk buffering into this. And there is also some research and consultancy necessary, which should be done by this. a problem with the mic? Okay. Let's try off them. Okay. Okay. Well, I'll go for this one. Uh, yeah, I think we are more or less all on the same page. Uh, the here, the what is important is to <coughs> not to concentrate on one particular solution. We need to look at all the all the possibilities. Looking at how, how we can utilize uh, relatively cold fluid. And I mean, we have, for example, in Iceland, we have district heating system which are operating at, uh, I think it's like 50 or 60 degrees hot water. So it's successfully been operated. Uh, and we also need to look at them and uh, continue exploring possibilities of EGS and things like that, even though that is in the future. And well, probably in the future. Another thing which is uh, uh, critical, I uh, mentioned earlier, that is related to the uh, cost of exploration, and that can be approached at least in two ways. Firstly, to, uh, by better investigation, as I mentioned earlier, to have, have, a, have a better surveys, to be able to target uh, the resource better and, and increase, therefore, the likelihood of a successful, successful well. 
uh, as Inko said, the, the, the success rate is in geothermal is quite high, but the, when comparing this though to oil and gas, we have this, it is advantage is that the value from the well is usually considerably lower than what you may get from oil and gas. So they can afford actually many different things in, in drilling, which we, we cannot afford in, in geothermal. Uh, drilling in Germany actually is, is quite expensive. I don't think it's a, probably is a delicate matter to touch on, but th there might be some worth uh, uh, investigating how, how, how come it seems to be more expe expensive than in the neighboring countries. And yeah, and also further development in, in, in the EGS, as I mentioned, uh, that is, uh, well, yeah, probably is going to yeah, take quite some years yet. Even it has been been developed for, for quite many years, but probably needs some more years before it can, can, can be uh, implemented commercially. But if that uh, the source opens up, it's a huge one. And we could have a lot of, lot of opportunities there. Yeah, well, it's always a challenge to be the last, but <laughs> I mean, I think we agree that, that Europe has a lot of untapped geothermal resources. There are different technologies where you can actually utilize those resources. Uh, we have the expertise, whether that is from a geological point of view or engineering point of view. What are we lacking? We are lacking the political will and political decision, in my mind, and the funding. Because, I mean, it's, it's also about independency. Do we want to be where we are? Or do we want to tap into our own natural resources? They are there. Uh, and like, like Inga said, we prob probably need to communicate better. But we have, though, been communicating this for decades to the politics, to the, to the, to, to the financial institutions. The perceived risk in geothermal is more than the actual risk. Uh, and this is a fact. So, so it's a political decision. Let's go and utilize our own resources. That, that, that's what it is about, in my mind. The future is bright. It's a question if we want to be there or not. Yeah, I think that's a wonderfully succinct end to the official part of the panel. But, whoa, we have many questions, so let me try this with the mic. I think you went up first, so... Um, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm a student from uh, Duisburg Essen University. Um, you're talking about that you don't have a lot of students who are interested in this topic. Um, I think also so, <laughs> but at least I'm here. Um, so we do have some people who are um, interested and who want to, to change the world. Um, it's a very interesting topic, I think, and um, uh, thank you for such information. And my question is... Um, Next, um, how could we use the ter geothermal energy for um, instance for the um, carbon capture and storage, car carbon capture and utilization on the basis of waste incineration plant, for instance? Do you have any examples in this area? Thank you. Maybe the Icelandic colleagues will head up, but there's a project in, in Iceland where they store, where they, they capture the CO2 and store it into the basalt rocks where it just uh, precipitate and becomes uh, part of the formation. So that's one possibility, but it's quite, quite young technology in this part. Um, I mean the, uh, sorry, <laughs> I mean the um, um, heat energy demand. So. Um, because of um, um, this technology of uh, carbon capture and storage um, needs a lot of heating, a lot of heat energy. And um, could you example, uh, to give me an example or to um, explain how can we use the ge geothermal systems for um, instance for TCU and CCS? I don't know if I'm going to be able to, to partly answer your question, but I, I think later on the agenda today is a, is a 
uh, talk on, on on Icelandic technology being being developed, and the company is called Carfix, where they actually inject the CO2 into the ground again, and and it uh, makes a rock formation. So so that's one way to do it, and th there are other technologies as well where you are pumping the CO2 into into the ground and keeping it there as a, as a gas or as a liquid. Uh, so I mean, there are there are different technologies being developed now to to capture the CO2 from from geothermal and from the from other aspects as well. But I know one of the Icelanders, Kristen, is going to do a little bit of, of a speech on this technology later today. Okay, since we're actually sh um, short on time, yeah. would you mind passing the mic to the person behind you? Hi, yeah. Hi. Uh, Joanna Bryson, I'm a professor at Hertie School here on technology policy. And I was really interested in this question about why, I realize, as you say, sensitive topic, but why uh, German uh, municipalities don't even know that this uh, information is exposed. In the United States, a lot of the people that would be likely to be promoting that would actually be the companies that would be making money out of being the ones who were doing the drilling. So I'm wondering if there's some kind of structural problem, why, why why that communication isn't happening? Is it because the, it, there isn't anyone who's particularly motivated? I mean, if it is being done by government, uh, the drilling also is being done by government, then we need to make it somebody's job to do that promotion. But if there's, if there's corporations involved, I don't see why they wouldn't get out and say, hey, do you know we could do this for you? So maybe Inga? Um, uh, yeah, well, well, one reason one reason might be that uh, the topic geothermal energy is totally new for the municipality. So this is actually since one year they deal now with geothermal energy. But still I'm surprised that they don't know about this geothermal information system because it tells you also something about the geological subsurface, which might be interesting for municipalities in different ways. Um, I, I think it has to do with expertise in the municipalities because they they didn't need to care for exploration or subsurface. But, but the point is that, so they aren't pulling for whatever reason. Why isn't someone pushing? Oh, yeah. Why, why isn't there someone who would make money doing the pushing and say, hey, here, I have some information that will help you? Yeah, making a little bit marketing and advertisement, right? Yeah, yeah. Mm. yeah. So this yeah. is maybe what we actually need, really telling it again and again. It's a little bit like, you know, when, when you're a researcher, you think, oh, I explained this one time, then you think, oh, they should have understood, yeah? <laughs> so it's also a little bit an own failure, yes? So this is I, what I would commit, but you are right. We need actually continuous communication, like a little bit like marketing, telling again and again the story. Yeah, that's right. So I think also we have a question from uh, Professor Dr. Susanne Bauta. Yes, thanks a lot. I'm from the, the German Research Center for Geosciences. Um, and I would like to touch upon um, perspectives and perception. And this links to also what Inga raised earlier and what I think several of you touched upon, the, the expectation of how many um, skilled workers at, at all levels, I take that very broad, will be needed in, in geothermal. At the same time, we see, for example, at Ger German universities that when the chair retires in reservoir technology, that the direction is changed to something like biogeochemistry, which is equally valid and also necessary. It's a choice, a valid choice that the universities make. So, but why is this changed? And how are we then going to educate our students? And I think this touches upon then the perception. I think somehow or other geothermal is binned with everything that goes in the subservice, which in Germany is seen critical. So it's an open question, how can we go about changing the perception so that we offer a perspective? So, we'd like to answer that. I think this may have to be the final question. <laughs> We're running out of time. Yeah. The <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Susanne. Um, um, in my world, because I have an industry background uh, from drilling and consulting, um, it is first, it's uh, one major point is that we educate the already graduated persons who are in practice, especially the engineers, and that we collect them. So a joint program uh, for um, graduates uh, from the pro professionals 
uh, would be very, very helpful. And then on the other hand, this is really also my personal experience uh, because I'm also still a professor <laughs> at a university. Um, and uh, the toxic fracking discussion in Germany is, is really not helpful to get younger people into our, our field of research and engineering. It is really a problem if, uh, if so um, an oil industry topic is really um, damaging uh, the image of uh, our energy and our process because we use the same technology to get to the reservoir drilling, more or less. And this is, and, and we really experienced a drawdown of the um, 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 freshman numbers uh, with increasing uh, fracking discussion. And so we need to work on, and this is the marketing point, uh, uh, we need really to work on to improve and enhance the image of geothermal energy. And therefore, this, it is important that we have, I'm really convinced on this, that we have a science a com, um, a com, uh, um, correlation in the projects that we do this proper and right and in different fields. So I believe you had one final question. Oh. Three minutes left, so. <laughs> okay, I'll hurry up. So I'm Thomas Kohl and um, I'm leading the Helmholtz Geothermal Program in the uh, research topic energy. Um, and we have at KIT uh, the largest, or initiated, well, possibly the largest research um, projects that we have in, in jointly with other, uh, with the EGFZ. <coughs> um, but there are two topics that I would like to raise. Um, the one is we might speak also on new topics and new technologies like storage, high temperature storage. I think this is also a new technology that needs to come. So just suffering from the heat that we have right now in, in Berlin, uh, so we can might possibly also inject uh, this heat in the underground. Um, and uh, so this requires completely different geological setting uh, than we have on, uh, on production. And another thing is that we are here at KIT in Karlsruhe in the Rheingraben, which is one of the hottest spots, maybe the hottest anomalies in Germany on uh, Central Europe, um, with temperatures above 200 degrees. Uh, but these systems are coming from fractured systems. So these are fractured faulted systems as they are in Iceland. And I think this is also a kind of a joint expertise that we can explore in future and how to operate fractured systems safely um, at long term. And this is also to get the acceptance in the population running. Okay, thank you. So thanks for that input. I think we have to wrap this up. So um, two minutes left. So uh, I would like to thank all of our panelists for a very lively and I think enlightening discussion to kick off this day. And of course, in this room, we are preaching to the converted, right? You wouldn't be joining us here if you weren't interested in renewables. So uh, maybe one nice takeaway from this discussion could be to um, talk to other people about geothermal and what you have learned today and just carry this knowledge into parts of society that may be skeptical about geothermal because that's the only way we can propel change. So thank you very much for your time and enjoy the rest of the summit.